your Bibles tonight, and let's turn back to Ephesians chapter 6, if you would, and let's refresh our memories a little bit on what we studied last night in preparation for where we're going tonight. I'm going to cover, I covered one thing last night, and we're going to co try to cover three tonight in preparation for the service tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, uh, you don't want to miss it, and you, you do want to invite people here tomorrow night. Uh, pastors, if you know a pastor, bring your pastor. Bring somebody else's pastor. Bring church leaders. Bring anybody that you can think of that goes to some other church. Bring them here tomorrow night. It's very, very important that people see what really is going on. Got a call today from a fellow pastor, Brother Lonnie Burks, called me today, uh, was asking me about, uh, he said there's some things going on down in Harrison with a, with a church, and they're just doing all of the things that, he knew that I was dealing with, and uh, they they want this information. And asking me when we're going to have it done, I said as soon as I get it done, Brother Lonnie, we'll send it down. It is such a need. I've I've called this part of the presentation so far the invasion. This is what's going on. You remember the diagram last night where we have principalities and powers and all these things, and they're invading. They're invading our homes. They're invading our country. They are invading our churches. They're, they're actually in places where they, they're not supposed to be. In fact, I want you to do something that just, that just occurred to me. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, if you would. Hold your place there in Ephesians and turn to 1 Samuel 17. I want to show you something that the Lord showed me a few years ago. And uh, it, has, it has helped me a lot as a pastor. It's helped me a lot as a dad. It's helped me a lot as a husband. Uh, to, to, to know exactly how the devil works and to know about realms of authority. In 1 Samuel 17, this is the story about David and Goliath. We know that part of the story, but I want you to look at a detail that the Bible gives us, and it's very interesting. <clears throat> it says, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies uh, to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah. Now that is that just hit me one day because I'm, I'm reading that and the Philistines, now the Philistines are the enemies of God and the enemies of God's people. Amen? You, you know about the Philistines, right? They're never represented in the Bible as being part of the righteous or as being people that are going to get converted. As far as I know, the Philistines all died lost. Okay, The Philistines were the constant enemy of Israel. Now here they are, they have moved in, and they're at Shoko, and the Bible says that Shoko belongeth to who? Judah. You know what that tells me? They're trespassing. They, see, God gave that land to Judah, didn't he? God gave it to Judah and told Judah, you pass it down throughout generations. Your kids and your grandkids... And your posterity is going to live in this land. Don't let anybody else have it. Don't sell it. Don't give it away. You're to hand it down. And that ground was sacred to them. And so now the Philistines are on that land and they are trespassing, which means that the Philistines need to be removed off of the land. Are you listening to me tonight? I want to tell you something. The devil and all these things, they ha he has trespassed into areas that don't belong to him. When he moves into our church, he has no business here. He ought to be run off. Amen? When he moves into our home, he has no business there. He needs to be run off. This is, I mean, you just, you'll find these illustrations all throughout the scriptures of the Bible telling us about there are realms of authority around us and we're part of that and if something else moves in that shouldn't be there get it out get it out it has no business in there so back to Ephesians Paul's telling us about what to look for about who's going to invade and so he says in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 finally my brethren be strong in who? The Lord. Not in yourself. You can't do it yourself. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of whose might? His might. Now, don't you get that word power 
and might. Strong power and might. Those are powerful words, aren't they? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, which means that we have readily available to us everything that we need to fight off what it is that we need to fight off. Was David completely um, secure in his battle with Goliath? What is it that he... When, when Saul tried to give him his armor... David said, uh-uh, this, I haven't tested that out. I'm not going to have anything to do with it. I'm just going to go with the Lord. The Lord's going to give me the victory. And David was right. God gave him the victory. Can I hear you say amen? Because God doesn't want the Philistines on Judah's ground either. And if God doesn't want things in your home, then you can rest assured if you go to the Lord and say, God, I'm ready to go to battle. Will you help me? My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. That's what David said. When you get ready to fight off things that are going on in your church that's not right, rest assured when you go to the Lord, God's going to give you the things that you need to fight them off. And let me just ask this in general in preparation for, for what, part of the things I'm going to teach you tonight. Do, do we all have needs, don't we? Amen. We all have needs. We, all, we try to get through this life. And, and God has made human beings in such a ways that we don't live like animals. We can't just go out and take care of ourselves. We have needs, don't we? We have needs. And, so, and we have desires. We have wants. We have things that we want. And so I'm going to show you tonight two ways. Two ways. That you can get, number one, the things that you need. Number two, the things that you want. There is always God's way and the world's way. Amen? There is always God's way and the world's way. Now, God told us as Christians to be separate from the world. That means when God called us out of sin and He saved us and He chose us, he expects us not to keep acting like we used to act when we were lost. Can I hear you say, you understand that, right? So much of the church right now is so full of the world that you cannot tell the difference. And I'm not just talking about in their dress appearance. I'm talking about in the way they live and in the way they act. Because they're still doing things the world's way. They're meeting their needs and their wants the world's way. And God said, you can't do that. God said, get out of Babylon. Because that's exactly what it is. But He says to us, we can have the things, number one, that we need. And you know for a fact that you even have the things that you desire that you don't. How many of you have things that you don't really need, but you have them? Everybody in this room, right? Where did they come from? God even gives us the things that we want that sometimes we don't need. Can I hear you say amen? Amen. amen. That's a good God, isn't it? He's not just about us just barely getting by. He takes care of His sheep. Takes care of His people. Now I want to ask you a real Important question. How is it that you can have power on this earth? How is it that you can have the things that you need? And how is it that you can have power with God? Somebody answer that question. How is it done? It's the most simplest thing in the world. Who said that? Prayer. You have not because you ask not. See, it's pretty simple, isn't it? So we, we either do one of two things. We have things that we need. We can either ask God. And does God turn his people down? No. Absolutely not. No, he doesn't turn his people. I, I don't want to spend an hour with you tonight going through the scripture dealing with prayer. You're looking at a guy that God has had to deal with concerning prayer. And I want to tell you something. I'm not some wild-eyed, crazy-headed charismatic says that if you're going to be a Christian, you're going to be rich. But I am telling you that my father freely gives us all that he gave us his only son. And anything that we ask for less than that, surely God gives us things. 
Now you say, well, Brother Mike, I asked for something, didn't get it. Well, I want to tell you something. Number one, God's not a thief. He never took anything away from us, did he? God just gave you something better. Maybe you hadn't realized it yet. But our God's a good God. Or we could do it the world's way. And I'm going to show you how that works tonight. But back in Ephesians, he said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not. There is a, there's a war going on here, a wrestling, a fight. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, number one, principalities. We dealt with that last night. Number two, powers. Powers. I'm going to deal with that. Number three, rulers of the darkness of this world. Think about the metaphors. Think about the symbolism of darkness. God is trying to describe for us and explain to us what realms these devils work in. And then, against spiritual wickedness, where? In high places. God dealt with me about that this afternoon while eating steak at John's house. I don't know what the connection is, okay? But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what I think God was showing me based upon what I see here in the Word of God. We dealt with principalities last night. Let's deal with powers. Okay? Now, some of this, when I started dissecting this down, it was fairly simple. Powers, witchcraft, magic, ESP, which is extrasensory perception. The supposed ability that someone would have to be able to read your mind. Okay? Think about, now think, think about these things and think about what the Bible says. Okay? In fact, let's deal with ESP right now for a minute because this is what's on my heart. ESP, extrasensory perception. The ability that people claim they have to be able to read somebody's mind or discern their thoughts and be able to pick up. Now, they tell you that everybody gives off these brain waves and that some people have the ability to tune in to those wave frequencies and understand them, okay? See, that's a lie. But what I do believe is that there are some people who are tuned in to the demonic world, psychics, who are tuned in, who are listening to devils tell them what this other person might be thinking. Now... Let's go to the scriptures. When Jesus was on this earth, do you remember all those times when Jesus would be with the Pharisees and the Bible would say, and Jesus perceived their thoughts? You remember those times? Jesus was reading their mind. Was, now, hold on a second. Because I'm going to, this is neat, because I'm going to show you how this ties in with scripture. Remember who Jesus is. He is the Word of God, isn't He? And the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And the Word of God is able to discern between the thoughts and the intents of the hearts. Can I hear you? Isn't that right? Jesus, therefore, being the Word of God, He was able to tell what was on these guys' heart, wasn't He? Isn't that neat? And I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. There is a gift that I believe that God will give to His people called discernment. How many of you would like discernment? Say amen. You want to know the truth and you want to know whether things are... I, I mean, every now and then you're in a situation and it just seems like you're going... Boy, I don't know about this. I don't, you, know what the, you know what's going on? The Holy Ghost of God is saying, pull back from this for a minute. And then later on, the Holy Ghost will draw us to the Word and we'll read Scripture, won't we, John? We'll read Scripture and we'll say, that's exactly what was going on in that situation and God knew it. Have you ever had experience like that? Say amen. You know, the, and so we can have... We can have abilities that human beings don't have, but we don't get them from devils. We get them from the Word of God and through the Holy Ghost of God. Do you believe that? Say amen. God wants to equip us with these things. ESP, witchcraft, telekinesis, the ability to... Ooh, I like this. 
Telekinesis. Does anybody know what that is? Telekinesis. Okay. Moving on. You've obviously practiced this before. No, you haven't done this. Okay. <laughs> Telekinesis. <laughs> I just like this. It's the ability to move objects with your mind. You've seen these guys say, like that, and they'll bend a spoon. whoop de do. I can bend a spoon. Matthew can bend a spoon. Bending a spoon is nothing. Try moving a mountain. We can. If we have faith as a grain of mustard seed, we could say to this mountain, Be thou removed and cast into the sea, and it shall be done. How many of you believe the word of God? Say amen. amen. See, I like it. Because I don't have to get into the demonic realm to live. I just need to trust in the old book and in the power that God wants to give us. Can I hear you say amen? amen. Telekinesis. Now these things, and I'm going to break some of these down here in a little bit. These things are seen in the, in the church. Witchcraft and these things are moving into the church, guys. It's dangerous. You're going to hear more about it tomorrow night, but it's there. Manifestations such as holy laughter. You remember the video that I showed when I was here last time? We have a copy of out on the table. If you want to see some of the occult manifestations that are going on in church, there's a video back here called The Holy Bible, A Sure Word of Prophecy. And I give video documentation of those occult things being going on inside of so-called churches. Altered states of consciousness, beast spirits, and so on. These are in the church. They're also manifested in certain music and in other forms of entertainment. I want to tell you something. Our world is flooded. Kids are watching videos, HBO, TV shows, cartoons that are laced with the occult, magic, demonic spirits. You name it. Those things are full of them. And our kids are sitting and feeding on that stuff. Whether they're watching the movie, or they're watching the cartoon, or they're reading the book, or the comic book, or whatever it is, our kids are eating this stuff up. And we sit them in Sunday school for an hour and try to teach them little stories out of the Old Testament. And we're losing our kids. Huh? Huh? We are losing our kids to this stuff. Music. Every, I want to tell you something. There was a time when pastors stood up behind pulpits and preached against rock and roll music. How huh? Do you remember those days? You don't hear them do it anymore, do you? Why? Because they're playing the same music now in the church. I'll show you that tomorrow night, too. So, we're being invaded. We're being bombarded. Deuteronomy chapter 18. You might want to turn your Bible there and take a look at it if you can't see the screen. God gave, He showed us, there's nine things here that He said don't do. Nine things here. He said, I don't want, I don't want to catch any of my people doing these things. Number one, He said, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through fire. That's child sacrifice. And you say, well, thank God we don't do that now. What do you think an abortion clinic is? Huh? What do you think an abortion clinic is? You think that's a medical place? No, it's a temple of Baal where they do child sacrifices there. And if you don't buy that, you've been reading the wrong Bible. Amen? Because God said that life begins in the womb. You don't believe that? God called John the Baptist from the womb. When John the Baptist was still in the womb, he leapt at the news that Mary was going to have Jesus, didn't he? See, he was alive then. He was full of the Holy Ghost then. From his mother's womb, the Bible says. And for anybody to go in there and rip that out of there, they're a murderer. And I want to tell you this. I want to tell you, you listen. They're a murderer. And if you consented to it, you're a murderer, and you ought to be real careful about the people you voted for. Or they want your amens. Because now we have a Congress 
where a majority of them favors going in a woman's body and ripping that baby out of there. And God's not going to let that stuff go on very long in this country, is he? He's about had enough of it. I know I have. Child sacrifice. Or that useth divination. I'll explain that. Or an observer of times. Or an enchanter. Or a witch. Or a charmer. Or a consulter with familiar spirits. Or a wizard. Or a necromancer. I got tickled. I was teaching this in our church. I was doing a month-long series, Brother John, on our church at our church about these nine practices and I talked about a necromancer. Does anybody know what a necromancer is? And my mother-in-law said, yeah, your son, Caleb, we have a little, little boy, he's three years old. And I went for and I thought for a minute and he's all the time when he's in my wife's arms, he is just kissing her on the neck. A neck romancer. Yeah. It took me a while too. And I almost had to tell my mother-in-law to shut up in church, but Necromancer, does anybody know what that is? I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to show you a guy that practices it that you've seen on television, and you're going to go, no way. Okay? These things God said, do, don't do. Now, he said, don't use divination. What is divination? It is a means to obtain information. Divination is a way to tap into the spiritual world to get information. Uh... Have you ever had your, Mike, have you ever had your palm red? Let's see it. Let's see it. Now it's red. Okay? I love doing that. That's twice I've picked on Mike now. Two services in a row. Palm reading. I want to show you a verse out of the Bible that talks about palm reading. I like it. Uh, tarot card, cardomancy is what it's called. Reading tarot cards. You remember the, the, the lady from Snow White there? Mirror, mirror on the wall. That's called scrying. S-C-R-Y-I-N-G. Scrying. It's an occult practice. It's a form of divination. Or you look into a bowl of mercury or water and you glance or you, you gaze into it or a crystal ball. Those are all forms of scrying. Those are being performed in the Lord of the Rings books. And Harry Potter, okay? And I'll get to those guys in a minute. But God said, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't have anything to do with it whatsoever. He said, stay away from it. Palm reading. I like this. Because in all these things, there's a Bible equivalent. That's right. God said to Israel, whom he has put on the back burner for now, he said, can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. God said, behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. I read that verse and I'm going, wow. See, you got lines on your hand, don't you? How many of you got lines on your hand? Some more than others, amen? But we've all got lines on our hands. And God said, I have carved you into my hands. I'll never forget you. Every time I... And he said, and I was looking at that verse, I'm going, God, I don't get that. I'm looking at my hand. And God said, read the rest of the verse. He said, thy walls are continually before me. The walls of Jerusalem is what he's talking about. And if you look in the book of Revelation, God said the walls of New Jerusalem, they have four walls, and they have three gates on each wall for the 12 tribes of Israel. You have 12 tribes of Israel carved into the fingers, into the palms of your hand. And God said, I'll never, ever forget my promise to you. I've carved it in. Somebody say amen. amen. So you know what? People's, people will go to somebody and they'll say, read my future. Read my future. And some guy will go, oh, yeah, this is your, this is your uh, lifeline. You know this, huh? Yeah. Yeah. This is your lifeline. This is, this is, and you know what? They're going to get it wrong. Instead of looking at your hand, remind God to look at His, and you'll know your future. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that sweet? I like it. But see, the devil took it, 
and he perverted it, didn't he? That's why God said, don't do it that way. I have the better alternative. Tarot cards. Okay? Tarot cards. Cards, methods of divination. You lay out cards and you're supposed to read the future or gain information about somebody. Kids. Kids are playing tarot card games all over the place. Games like card captors. Does that sound familiar? Card captors. A lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, fast food places, when they give out Happy Meals, they usually give out these cards and you collect the cards and you play them. And what happens is that the game with these cards is you collect certain cards and you attain like a magical power now that you've collected a number of cards or a certain type of cards. This particular game here called Card Captors is played like, here's the story from their website. The story of card captor Sakura involves the daily life of a grade schooler named Sakura. She found a book called The Clow in the basement of her house. It contains magical cards called Clow cards, which are accidentally scattered all over town. With the help of, notice this, the beast of the seal. Boy, does that have biblical overtones to it. The beast of the seal, Kerberos, Sakura began her journey to retrieve the cards in order to prevent a, da a disaster. In other words, the cards of divination are being handed out to our children, being bought by our kids or traded by our kids in the schools. And parents, don't assume that you know everything your kid's doing. Amen? Your mama didn't know everything you was doing, right? So don't assume that you know everything your kids or grandkids are doing. And I promise you, some kids are practicing divination and they're doing it in a, and you say, oh, they're just kids. They don't get anything out of it. Yeah, but what are we teaching them? We're teaching them things that God said, don't let them do, and we're letting them do. Whether they get a kick out of it or not, whether they think it's a game or not, whether they don't think, and, and you know the thing about God and the devil is, in order to be in God's religion, you have to believe there's a God, right? To be in the devil's religion, you don't have to believe anything. So people say, oh, I don't believe that. And then supposedly that negates everything like it's no big deal. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. It's there. And it's true. Astrology. How many of you know your sign? Oh, yeah, you all do. I used to when I was young, when I was about his age, I used to run home every day from school and grab the local paper and read, I'm a Gemini. And I would read under Gemini. And this would be in the afternoon. And I would read that, and I would look at it and go, Wow, that's what happened to me today. I didn't know that what was written in that paper was for the next day. <laughs> right? But the truth of it is, see, it's people who are looking at the alignment of stars, stars are what in the Bible? Angels. And there are two groups of angels. God's angels and fallen ones. So when people look to stars, who are they turning to? God said that he doesn't want his people worshiping the host of heaven. That's what he said. So when people look to stars, what are they looking to? devils, fallen angels. Now here's the reverse of that. Instead of looking to the stars to try to find your future, read what Psalm 19 says. The heavens declare what? The glory of God. And the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Name me a place on the earth where you don't see stars. You see them everywhere, don't you? Same ones. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom. Who's the bridegroom? Jesus. And you know what the Bible's telling us? That at sunrise every day, when the sun rises every day, we're supposed to know that's a picture of Jesus Christ who rose from the dead. If there's any message in the stars, it is you need to be saved.
Amen? That's the message of the stars. Let's move on. Consulters with familiar spirits, Ouija boards, and such like. Do not let your kids or your grandkids have anything to do with that. Parker Brothers makes Ouija boards and sells it to kids. They've been doing it for years. I knew kids in our neighborhood that had Ouija boards. And I was, I, I didn't have any, I've never seen one. I've never actually handled one, looked at one. Because they're deadly. They're dangerous. You ever heard of the movie The Exorcist? About a little girl who's devil possessed? You know how she got that way? Ouija board. Ouija board. And these devils take control. Listen, listen this stuff is real. This stuff is real. There are devils behind this stuff who have power, don't they? And they work. And they're trying to suck our kids into it. Channeling. These are consulters with familiar spirits. Those who channel. Guided imagery. Guided imagery is being used in our public school systems. Teachers are trained to sit their kids down in a little, little circle or to lay them down on the floor and tell them to empty their mind. Listen to your kids. Train and instruct your kids when they go to public school that if, if anybody ever asks them to, to, get, to sort of get quiet and empty their mind, they run home and tell mom and daddy. And mom and daddy, you have every right in the world to call that school and say, cut it out. You won't let me teach Christian religion in your school, then you don't be teaching my kids pagan religion in your school either. You take a stand. Can I hear you say amen? You don't have to put up with that godless nonsense in your school. You, that's your tax money, by the way. Amen? Amen. Which means you, where the money is, you've got a right to say something about it. And too many parents for too long have sat and done nothing about what's going on in our schools. That's why it's going on. Because the teachers and the school administrators know that nobody's going to do anything about it. But it's guided imagery. And what they're doing, see what they do is, they tell your kid, listen, now lay down and empty your mind and think of a place. Now go to that place in your mind, a real nice place. Oh, and when you get there, you're going to meet a friend. Guess who that is? It's a familiar spirit waiting on them. I'm not kidding you guys. This stuff is deadly. It's deadly. Yoga. Yoga opens up your mind. Hypnosis. Do not be hypnotized. Period. Don't let anybody... anybody. See, you know how God designed us? You know how God built us? God built us with logic. In our, conscience, in our conscious minds, we're designed to be able to filter certain nonsense out. How many of you... Some are better at it than others. Amen, ladies. You know... No, ladies, you're better at it than your husbands. Get mad at me. Yeah, I'll offend you later. I'm not offending you now. I'll do it later. But we're designed to be sober. The Bible says be sober, doesn't it? Think about it. Be sober. The opposite of that is to be drunk. And when you're under hypnosis, you are drunk. You are open to suggestion just as a drunk person is. What does a guy at a bar know he's got to get the girl at the bar? He's got to get her drunk, right? Same thing. God designed us with filters, firewalls built in. When you're under hypnosis, those filters are shut down. And you're open to realms that you don't want to be open to. If you're trying to quit smoking, ask God to help you quit smoking. You don't need to be hypnotized. I believe God to help you. Amen? Amen? All these things. The latest thing out now, there's a book series called Conversations with God. There's a movie coming out based upon the book. A lady in my church brought this to me. I didn't pay much attention to it until I started researching this. This guy says, this guy says that he talked to God. You know what he was really talking to? A familiar spirit, a lying devil. But he says that God told him that preachers and the Bible 
are not true. Oh, by the way, he also asked God about sex, and God said, Oh, have fun. <laughs> kind of tells you right there he wasn't talking to the real God, right? You'd be surprised at how closely related this book and this movie is with the new church that's rising up. There's a link there. I'll probably explain it tomorrow night. But this guy, through a lying, familiar spirit, channeled what he thought was God, and he was wrong. Witchcraft, magic, sorcery. You see there, uh, there if you, in case you don't know, there on the left is Gandalf the Grey. Who is Gandalf the Grey? He is the wizard in the Lord of the Rings. He practices wizardry. Now, here's the funny thing. They have Sunday school lessons. And youth pastors, and actually pastors, are saying that Gandalf here is a Christ figure. That he's Jesus. That you can learn about Jesus by reading about Gandalf, a wizard. Is that true? Now remember what I showed you last night. Realms of authority. The Bible is the final authority, is it not? And if the Bible says you should not consult with the wizard, then what does that mean? It means don't do it. Amen? If it says don't commit adultery, does that mean you can commit adultery? No. And if it says don't consult with a wizard, does it mean you can consult with a wizard? And the answer is no. And so in order to get church people and pastors to consult with wizards, we had to get this out of the way. And that's exactly what they've done. So now where is the authority going? Who's in charge? Is it the divine Son of God in whom is no guile? No. It's a wizard named Gandalf. That's who the new Jesus is. That's who this is. God said don't have anything to do with it. Wicca. Fastest growing religion among teenage girls is Wicca in witchcraft. I almost guarantee you that if you were to go to your child's school library, you will find books on witchcraft and Wicca. Okay? Okay? I almost guarantee you they'll be there. They try to present it as a beautiful religion. Oh, we're just tapping into the, the, the power that's in the, that's in the universe. No, they're tapping into spiritual fornication is what it is. It concentrates and centers itself around women. Our teenage girls are buying into this. This is a young lady, 15 years old, a practicing witch. She was kicked out of her high school because she cast a spell upon a teacher. The teacher actually did get sick as a result of the spell. That's why they kicked her out of school. And, of course, she went fighting for her constitutional rights. She has a right to practice her religion in the school. But can you imagine a girl, 15 years old, who's so good at witchcraft that her spells actually worked? And it, it is scary. And I promise you, your kids are walking down the hall with witches, practicing, warlocks, practicing, Boys that play Dungeons and Dragons, these occult-related games. Boys and girls whose minds are so infested with the occult by the movies and the TV and the video games that they play. Your kids and your grandkids are playing occult video games. They're learning to use magic powers by way of a computer. And we're not doing anything. We're, remember, we're supposed to take a stand, right? This is watchman on the wall. We're supposed to see the sword coming and blow the trumpet. Be careful what you buy them for Christmas. Amen? I bought this. I, I, I couldn't. My, my wife pointed it out to me. We, I have this book. We were in the mall. I hate the mall. The bookstore in the mall. Right at eye level of a 9, 10, 11-year-old girl 
was this book. It's called A Girl's Guide to Casting Spells, written for adolescent girls. One girl, uh, you go to Amazon.com, you read these things that kids write about it. Tara, medical stu mi a middle school student, said, this book taught me how to do spells without harming others or things. Rebecca, who called herself a spellcaster, said, this is a really nice book. Other books related to it. Enchantments, the book of spells, the little book of love spells, teen witch, teaching teenage girls how to practice witchcraft. Teenage girls who sit in Sunday school classes, teaching them how to practice witchcraft. Folks, let's pull our head out of the sand and think that it could be going on in this church. Or at least in our families. Get involved. Lord of the Rings. Look at the book up here. Finding God in the Lord of the Rings. There's another one called Finding God in Harry Potter. The authors find that truth and fiction are not as far apart as they seem. That's a lie, isn't it? That's a lie. You see, truth and fiction are opposites, aren't they? And God said, you don't... God called... He had day and night, didn't he? Light and darkness. And the first thing that God did with light was he divided it from darkness. He made them separate, didn't he? But this guy says that truth and fiction are actually fused together. This guy said the tales of Tolkien offer a rich tapestry of redemption, values, and faith from which we may learn much. Now, the guy who wrote this was named Kurt Bruner. He is with Focus on the Family, James Dobson. In our, yeah, it is. It's in your Bible bookstores. Now, I, wanna, I want you to keep that in mind. How many of you have heard of James Dobson, Focus on the Family? I'm going to show you something that God dealt with me about tonight. Huh? Yeah, yeah, he is with Focus. He is part of their organization. Now, I'm going to show you something tonight from the Scriptures that I believe is true, that I believe God's trying to warn us about in these last days. Chronicles of Narnia. You ever heard of that? Read the books, saw the movie. I got a pastor's guide to the Chronicles of Narnia. Because we're supposed to take as many people as we can to the movie theater so they could watch this movie about magic and get saved. Yeah. Yeah. You see that lion up there? That's Jesus. That's what they say. Now, in, in this book... This lion dies, and he comes back to life again. See, it's Jesus, right? Oh, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. The real Jesus died, and by the power of God, came back to life. This lion died, and by the power of magic, came back to life. Think about it. There are two lions in the Bible. One of them's the lion of the tribe of Judah, who came back to life through the power of God. I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. He had the appearance of a lion, John said. And he had a deadly wound, which means he was dead. And he came back to life again. Who's that lion there? That's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But see, the Chronicles of Narnia is in all the churches now, being taught in all the Sunday school classes, as if you can find Jesus through this. And you know what the real deal is, John? The devil's trying to get the church to stop finding Jesus where he really is and look for him somewhere else. And Jesus warned us. He said, if any man says, here is Christ or there... Believe it not. You know where Christ is? Right here. So when they tell you, oh, we have to use these things with lost people so they'll understand. No, it's a trick. And it's working very effectively. Very effectively. Paul said, oh foolish Galatians, who hath what? Bewitched you. You remember that show, Bewitched, right? Now I'm going I'm to show you, so I'm going to teach you something. Okay? 
You listen to these clowns on the radio and on TV, and they'll tell you that you have to use faith words or words of power, or you have to say the right things to invoke God's blessing. And they tell you about faith as if they have a ton of it. Actually, they don't. They just have all of your money. And they teach you that unless you have all the faith and you say all the right things, unless you do that, you won't release God's faith-working, miracle-working power in your life and you won't have anything because you're not doing it all right. That's not true. You cry out unto the Lord. And it doesn't, I want to tell you something. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, finish it, shall be saved, period. Do you remember the show Bewitched? You remember Aunt Clara? You remember Aunt Clara? She was the one that kept messing everything up, right? You know why? She wasn't saying all the right things. See, that's witchcraft. The spells have, to, and, and in fact, if you read, and I've read several books written by witches on how to do these spells, these little kids have to learn how to draw the circle the right way, how to put the candles in the right place, how to use the right kind of herbs on a certain time of day when the moon is in this position in the sky, and you have to say these words three times exactly doing this. You have to do all the right things in order for the spell to work. See, that's witchcraft. It's also works salvation. And I'm, you're looking at a guy, and I preach this here at this church, building dedication. You're looking at a guy that believes grace is free. And you don't work for it. You don't say the right things for it. You just believe. Amen? So anything above that is witchcraft. And it's in our churches. By the way, witchcraft also has a principle that they don't hold to any authoritative power. And I'll tell you something. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. When you rebel, you're a witch. That's thus saith the Lord, by the way. You should amen on that one. What is necromancy? What are they doing up there in the little picture there? They're having a seance, aren't they? They're gathered around in a circle, and they're trying to get in touch with a dead person. Hmm. Abraham had a conversation with the rich man, didn't he? And you know what? Abraham wasn't going anywhere, and the rich man wasn't going anywhere. So you know what? We don't talk to dead people. Nobody does. Who are they talking to, Mike? Familiar spirits, lying devils. Okay? How many of you knows who this guy is? Benny Hinn. He's a necromancer. He practices the art of talking to people that are dead. How many of you remember this lady here? Catherine Kuhlman. Does anybody, does that ring a bell? Late 60s, early 70s, long flowing dress, charismatic Pentecostal preacher lady went around the country. I believe in miracles, and she had healing ministries and all this stuff. Uh, there she is meeting with the Pope. That ought to tell you something right there. There she is healing a nun. That ought to tell you something right there. Remember what I said last night about principalities? They're in moving in. Well, Catherine Kuhlman died. <laughs> well, yeah, why? But she died. But she's back because she's been making regular appearances to Benny Hinn. Here's a quote from Benny Hinn on his TV show, This Is Your Day. He's, this is just one of many. He said, I saw myself walk into a room and there stood Catherine Kuhlman. And I've not seen Catherine in a dream or a vision in years. And she said, follow me. It was Catherine Kuhlman who took me, who introduced me to the Holy Spirit. He's a necromancer, isn't he? One of the biggest false prophets that there is alive.
life in this country, and millions follow him. Big name Christian leaders that I could name appear on his show to sell books. They're dealing with a necromancer when they should be saying, you're a false prophet. They won't do it. Rulers of the darkness of this world. We're going to wind this down, okay? This is the next thing that we wrestle against. Rulers of the what? Darkness, okay? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And this Word is the light. Thy Word is a what? Lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, okay? We are children of the day, the Bible says, and we walk not in darkness. We walk in the light. We have fellowship with the light, and this light is the light of the world, and it's the Word of God, and it's Jesus Christ. Is that what we believe? Say amen. When God, when God began to deal with you about your wicked sins, what did he do? Click. Turned the light on, didn't he? And you saw yourself for who you really were. Thank God for the light. Somebody say amen. God showed us who we really were. Every time the preacher, the, the preacher stands with the word of God and he preaches this book, God's turning the light on to some people to show them who they really are and who they need to be. I like being in the light, don't you? But there are people who are in darkness. Why? Because they don't comprehend this. See, the light shined into the darkness, John said, and the darkness comprehended it not. And so there are people, there are, there are divisions of devils who constantly, now we've, we've dealt with, a division of devils who deals primarily in attacking biblical authority. We've just talked about a division of devils that deals primarily with powers, magic powers, witchcraft, things like that. Now we're looking at a division of devils that are responsible for blinding the eyes of men so that they can't see, so that they walk in darkness. These are responsible for hiding the truth of the Word of God and blinding men with false doctrines and false religions. They are the, watch this, they are the powers behind the false Bible translations and false worship styles. Okay? They're the ones behind it. Proverbs 4.19 The way of the wicked is as what? What does it say? Darkness. God is associating wickedness with darkness. And I want to tell you something. Church member, listen to me. The devil will use anybody in this church that he can get his hands on. And one of the ways that he'll do is through your own personal sin. Your best, your best alternative is to keep your sins under the blood of Jesus Christ. Because if you don't, you will walk in darkness. This preacher will preach his guts out. And he's got guts to preach. Amen? He'll preach his guts out. And you won't get it. Or you'll fail to comprehend it. Or you'll rebel against it. Why? Because of your sin. And what are sins? Lust of the flesh. Lust of the eyes. Pride. Of life. Can I tell you what the biggest sin in the church is? It's pride. It's pride. And you know what harms proud people the most? They're too proud to recognize their pride. They think, listen to me, they think that other people have the problem, not them. They sit in a church service Amen, the preacher, because they just know that he's preaching to the people over on the other side. And they walk out, that's good preaching, Brother John. And I'll tell you something, you get your heart right with God, you'll walk out and say, ouch. Amen? 
And by the way, can I can I give you? I don't know. I don't know how John does it. I'll tell you how. If you move up to Festus, I'm going to tell you how I do it. Every now and then, I know my people's sins, and I preach on them. And I know that they're there, and I know that they got to know that I'm preaching right to them. But you know what? I can't back down. Not supposed to. Instead of people saying, Brother Mike, you were preaching right to me. And, you know, instead of me going, oh, no, 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 no. I go, yeah, I was. I love you. And you know what they say to me? Thank you. Thanks for not being afraid of me, Brother Mike. That's where my joy comes from, by the way. But you let your wickedness take control of your life. You're going to walk in darkness. This man will preach his guts out. You won't get it. You'll walk out saying, ah, that sermon, that drives a bone. So hang on to it. Hang on to it see where it gets you. Your best bet in life is to let it go and let God have it. Can I hear you say amen to that? Just let it go. Paul said forgetting those things which are behind. Didn't he? You're not, you're not going to find any word in the Bible where God said, now dig it back up now. Let's, let's, let's look at it again. He said let it go. Forget, forget those things behind. Let's press toward the mark. Amen? That's just, I just threw that in for free. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness. So you know what they say? They say, they say now this new Bible we come out with, it's a better translation than this old King James. It's got more light in it. You know what they're doing? They're calling darkness light. And they're calling light darkness. And if you don't believe that, listen to what they say about the King James. Oh, you can't understand that old archaic translation. They've just called light darkness by telling you, you won't be able to understand it. See how it works? That's exactly how it works. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Paul said, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. That means shine a light on them. Expose it for what it is. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. How many of you are ready for the day of the Lord? Be careful. He said, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not where? In darkness, because you wrestled against it. Amen? We wrestle against rulers of the darkness of this world. That that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not, what? See, when it's dark, what do we do? As do others. But let us watch and be what? Sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Except for your uncle. He was drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. Amen? Spiritual darkness, false doctrines. The charismatic movement is loaded with spiritual darkness. Darkness. I'm not just beating up on people because I don't agree with. This is not something that, oh, we have a, uh, we, we just disagree in doctrine. I'm telling you, these guys are false prophets and their doctrines are witchcraft and people are down in it like it was smooth wine. But they're being drunk. You listen to them. You've, heard, you've seen the video. Get the, get the video back here. You'll hear them say, they'll talk about being drunk. In the spirit. Get drunk in the spirit. These people are drunk in the spirit. And God said, don't get drunk. He said, be sober. And if you're drunk, you're in darkness. You're not in the light. The ecumenical movement. Being blinded to what's wrong with other religions and and, and embracing them all. Let's just all get together. We all worship the same God. That's darkness. The purpose-driven and emergent church. I'm going to deal with that tomorrow night. False Bible translations. They're all part and parcel of spiritual darkness and false doctrines. God said, For this cause God shall send them strong delusion 
that they should believe a lie. There's a prophecy here. God, in, at, at one point in the future, is going to turn this world over. And they're going to accept darkness, and they're going to call it light. Hence, you have a group called the Illuminati, or the Illuminated Ones. People who have sold out to the darkness of the devil, and yet they call themselves illuminated. See, they've changed darkness for light, haven't they? And that day is coming. God's going to turn people over. You better ask God. Don't assume anything. Don't assume that when it happens, well, I'm saved. I'll just, I'll just be on the other side. I think every Christian worth their salt ought to get down on their face before God and say, God, you know what kind of sorry, rotten rat I am. You know how wicked my heart and my mind is. And God, I'm begging you when that day comes, give me the light, not darkness. Amen. Amos chapter 5 said, Shall not the day of the Lord be what? Darkness. And not light, even very dark and no brightness in it. You see, because on that day, the prophets say, the sun is going to be darkened and the moon turned to blood and the stars will be cast out of the heavens. See, the stars and the moon were supposed to be the lights in the nighttime. Not even they are going to shine on that day. Well, that's dark, amen? Even very dark and no brightness in it. Zephaniah 1.15, that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. It's referred to in the... See, the New Age turns it all around. It's referred to in the New Age as the New Age or Newage because it rhymes with sewage. Amen? You've heard of the day of Aquarius, Right? That's the day. See, they're all referring to, they all, they all refer to a time when there's going to be a change in the world, a, a transformation of humanity to a higher level. And we're going to be illuminated and we're all going to, all going to get along and sing happy songs with everybody. That's kind of what they think. And then the aliens are going to come down. I kid you not. The aliens are going to come down, the ascended masters, and they're going to train us how to live together in peace and harmony. We are the world. Right? All sounds good. You see, you see, that's the world's way. God's way is, God said, I'm going to send my son down. And he's going to rule and reign. And they're going to beat their swords into plowshares. Somebody say amen. No war, no famine, no hunger. God's going to do it. I like God's way, don't you? They call it the Second Reformation. Why? Because they're going to start with the church first. The Second Great Awakening. They call it a paradigm shift. You know what a paradigm shift is? It's a major transformation in your thought or in your thinking process. Whereas you used to think that the earth was round... And then you find out it's a square, right? It just changed your thought completely. A paradigm shift. The great initiation. See, they're all talking about a day when this is going to happen. Now watch this. That paradigm shift. Guess where I found that phrase? Rick Warren. At pastors.com. His website of sermons that he sends out to all the preachers who are too lazy to study the Word of God, and they write down his sermons and get up and preach them. And Rick Warren said, Now I preach on repentance on every single Sunday without using the Word because the Word is misused today. It is misunderstood. So I talk about changing your mind, and I talk about paradigm shift. The new words for repentance, this is Rick Warren, the new words for repentance are paradigm shift. Pastors, we are in the paradigm shifting business. There's a connection there, isn't there? Something going on. Show up tomorrow night. You'll find out more. We'll deal with this last thing and then we'll be done. Spiritual wickedness in high places. The spirits behind the sinfulness of mankind. Alcohol, drugs. How many believe there are spirits associated with that? Say Amen. 
adultery, fornication, pornography, Sodom, spirits, sins of the tongue. How I many of you got sins of the tongue? You all better say amen. Listen, I won't get into that. Works of the flesh, spiritual wickedness in high places. There are divisions of devils who focus primarily on how can we get people. How can we get church people to sin? And they're good at it, aren't they? Aren't they? You just might as, we just might as well be honest. We're in church, right? They're good at it. Too good nowadays. Does anybody hear of Ted Haggard? I was going to, and God for, forbade me to do it, but he did allow me to use this one illustration because everybody's heard of it. I was just going to go down a list of famous people in, in churchianity over the last ten years that have come out or been exposed or, or whatever. The list just goes on. Ted Haggard, just recently, let me tell you who this guy is. He's a mega church man. His church boasts, and probably is true, of being the largest church in the whole country. We're talking 20, 25,000 people every week go to this guy's church out in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Okay? Big, happy-go-lucky, smiling all the time guy, patting everybody on the back. And I'll tell you something. <laughs> Nowadays, if you're going to preach on sin and preach on people's sins, you're not going to have a mega church. That's just all there is to it. So in order to have a church like this, you have to leave things out of your preaching or you don't get 25,000 people to show up. There just aren't that many good people in this world. Do you believe that? Say amen. The Bible does. Okay? So anyway, he's got this, he's got this big church that he boasts about, about how they're doing this and how they're doing that how they're, and how they're going to double in size. He's head of the Liberal National Association of Evangelicals, president of the group, linked in with James Dobson because there in Colorado this year at the election, there was going to be one of these gay marriage things on the ballot. And so Ted Haggard hooks in with James Dobson and says, we're, we're opposed to this. We don't like it. Well, about three weeks before the election, Ted Haggard's gay prostitute whom he had been visiting for the last three years on a monthly basis and whom he had also been purchasing the methamphetamine for exposed this guy because he found out who he was. Okay? And I'll watch this. As far as the realm of Christianity in this country... You don't get much higher than Ted Haggard, even though you've probably never heard of him. Practically every big-time minister that you hear on the radio, they've had dealings with this guy in some positive way or the other. So spiritual wickedness where? In high places. Think of the other big name guys that have fallen down in the toilet. Why? Because they were in high places. Now I want to show you this from the scriptures. Take your Bible, turn to Ezekiel chapter 8. I want you to see this. I want to, I, I've said this uh, probably ever since I started this ministry. God dealt with me about this. And to me, it's real. It's as real as anything else I've talked about tonight. You, know, you hear on the Christian radio and on the Christian TV circuits, they, you hear the word or the phrase, Christian leaders. You ever heard that phrase before? Christian leaders. Christian leaders. Christian leaders are... I got a, I got a thing, um, one of these brochures on my desk the other day uh, about a movie coming out this Christmas called the Nativity or something like that, supposedly about the birth of Jesus, and I don't trust it because it said Christian leaders of faith have endorsed and been, and I'm going, I don't trust it. 
Let me tell you, so I want to tell you something. I want you to listen to this. I want you to listen to this real well. And you can be mad at me tonight when you walk out of here. Nah, that's, that's your choice. But I want to tell you what the truth is. You have one Christian leader in your life, and it's this man sitting right here. And if you don't believe that, I'm sorry. But there is one man who stands between you and God on a daily basis who prays for your soul every day, and it's this guy. It's this rotten. You've heard me call him that before. I don't exalt men. Men are rotten. And this guy's no different. Amen? But God called him to stand to pray for you people every day. That's the calling God put on his life. And God's not sorry that he called him. You shouldn't be either. Amen. And I want to tell you something. And I run into this in just about every church I go to. Not all of them. But there's always people who listen to Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland and, and uh, all some of these other big names on the TV and on the radio. They listen to them every day. And then the pastor will get up. The pastor of their church, their pastor, will get up and will preach something out of the Word of God. And those people say, well, I was listening to so-and-so the other day, and he, uh, he disagrees with that. That's wrong. That's, that's wicked. You've taken a man who you don't even know. You don't know his life. You don't know anything about him. And you've placed him as an authority over your pastor. And I want to tell you something. There is no authority over your pastor other than this book and the Holy Ghost of God. Now, I'm saying all this to say this. We get into trouble when we start making hierarchies out of Christianity. You follow what I'm saying? Um, before we go to Ezekiel, look at this. I used this graphic the other night, and I just stuck it in here this evening. Because in the devil's realm, there are hierarchies of authority, aren't there? They just kind of go up the ladder. And the higher it is, the more wicked it is, right? The guys down here at the bottom, and I'll say this about Freemasons. You might know somebody that's a Freemason. You think, you know, they're a pretty good guy. They probably are because they're down here. I guarantee you, the higher up the ladder they go in Freemasonry, the more wicked they become because the secrets are being revealed. And they accept them as truth, and they are wicked beyond imagination. They look like nice guys. But the higher up they go, see their spiritual wickedness where? High places. Okay? So watch this. You know what's happened in the church? The church, over the last several years, has developed this hierarchy. Well, we got our pastor. Oh, then we got the denominational leaders. Then we got the big name ministry guys. Then we got a few guys up here to meet with the president every, once a week. You see, you know what that is? See, that's right out of Rome. Roman Catholicism is all about the hierarchy. You have a low-level priest here who answers to a local bishop up here, who answers to a cardinal, who answers to a pope. And at the top of the ladder is where the spiritual wickedness is. Amen? Even in Roman Catholicism, some of these low-level priests down here, some of them are, are, are good guys. They haven't molested a child. The higher up the ladder. You see how it works, right? Now I want you to look at, we're going to look at Ezekiel for a few minutes. What did Ezekiel see? What did God open Ezekiel's eyes to? Ezekiel chapter 8. Are you there? Say amen. I want us, I want us to go back to verse 5. He said unto me, uh, A son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes toward the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar this image of jealousy in the entry. And he said, Furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here. He's talking about all the people down here at the bottom. He said, They're all worshiping this idol, that I should go far off of my sanctuary. But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see what? Greater. We're going to go up the we're going to go up the rung a little bit here, and we're going to see something that's greater abomination. Then look at verse seven. And he brought me to the door of the court. That's where all the low level priests were. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. And he said, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. 
So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them 70 men. The number's getting smaller now. We did have the whole house of Israel. Now we got 70 men. Of the ancients of the house of Israel, in the midst of them stood uh, Jeazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. He said also unto me, verse 13, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. He's going to go up another level in the structure here of the people who are governing over Israel. And he said, the higher up we go, the greater the abomination. God showed me this tonight while I'm eating steak. Okay? He wanted you to know this. He wanted you to see this. So he said in verse 16, And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, was about five and twenty men. See, the higher we go up, the less men we got. You see that? Five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worshiped the sun toward the east. Verse 17, Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. Though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. It's one of the few places in the Bible where God said he wouldn't hear prayer. It's because these guys, these guys climbed up the ladder to get power. And the higher they got, the more wicked they became. We have that same tiered structure in most of Christianity in this country right now. You have the local congregations listening to the pastor who's reading from the manuals given to him by the Rick Warrens and the Bill Hybels and the Ted Haggards and all of these guys who are, listen to this, who are being controlled by the publishing houses such as Zondervan Press and Nav Press and, and uh, Thomas Nelson Publishers who are being controlled by unseen men above them, and the higher we get, the wickeder we get. Isn't that what we saw here? So you know what? God said, you don't even have to be a part of that junk. Which, by the way, as Christians, we are now all kings and priests with Christ, aren't we? And I believe in authority in the church, and I believe that man's it. But I'll tell you something. You've got a heart. You've got a mind. You can pray to God, can't you? You can read a Bible. God can show you things out of this book. And I guarantee you, if your heart's right and his heart's right, it'll all be the same thing, won't it? And I'm telling you right now, there's going to come a time when the true believers are going to have to shut their Christian radio off and their Christian television and we're going to have to quit ordering Sunday school literature because they're moving in. They're grueling from the top down. And the higher it goes, the more wicked it is. That's exactly what's going on in this world. And tomorrow night, I'm going to show you the culmination. And what I'm going to show you tomorrow night is probably the worst that you've ever seen it. And I promise you that in a year from now, I'll have to redo this because it's going to be worse. So make sure you bring people here tomorrow night to see this. Because spiritual wickedness is ruling in high places. And they're trying to take control. Remember, the, the daddy and the mama here, you remember that last night? They're trying to get control of them so they can have the little child. And it's all about ruling over. You see, Jesus said he hates the doctrine 
of the Nicolaitans. There's two words there. Nico, the Greek word for king or ruler, and Laetanes, the laity, the church members. He said he hates the doctrine of those who try to lord over the church members. He said he hates it. But that's exactly what they're trying to do. And we need to stand on a wall. And we need to blow a trumpet. Can I hear you say amen? God bless you. Brother John.